Thank you, Ben. And good afternoon or good morning, good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, and honor to chair this session on the power of platforms and the market. As Ben said, uh, my name is Andy Bayuni. I'm a journalist by profession, but I also sit on the oversight board of Facebook. Just to be clear, the, the oversight board is independent of Facebook. So don't hold back on my account in criticizing Facebook and all the other platforms. The events of the past week, the outage of Facebook services last week, and the, the testi testi testimony by the former Facebook employee in US Congress make this topic of our discussion uh, even more relevant. So, and for that, we have five excellent speakers on the topic of regulating big tech and platforms. Some of these speakers have built a name and reputation for really going strong after the big tech. You can find their bios in the program, so I'll be brief in introducing them. So we have uh, Andreas Mund. He is the president of the German Competition Authority of Bundeskartelan. And then next we have Prabhat Agarwal. He is the head of the G Digital Services and Platforms Unit at the European Commission. And then next we have Tina Larsen, who is the president of the National Commission for Data Protection or CNTD in Luxembourg. And then we have uh, Sean Heather who's in Washington DC. So it's morning there. Uh, he is the senior vice president of antitrust for the US Chamber of Commerce. Last but not least, we have Timo Wolken. Uh, he's a member of the, uh, member of the European Parliament. Uh, Timo is, has been called for a meeting, but he hopes to join us in the second half of the, this uh, session. Let me just state uh, the, the, the problem before we start the, this, this, the discussion. Uh, there is a consensus around the world among countries on regulating the big tech or platforms, uh, but not on exactly how to regulate them or how far should they regulate these companies. The European Union has uh, the Digital Services Act and Digital Market Act proposals on the table. Um, there is also, uh, so I think European Union is, is ahead of the game. Uh, there is still a problem of definition on or, categorize, on, or, or, or categorizing these companies. Uh, we know for sure that they are big and powerful. Uh, so there is uh, clearly a need to regulate them uh, because the problems are that we are seeing, uh, the question of harm, safety, human rights violations, disinformation, children's safety, etc. And there's also a question of these companies have become so big. Uh, so there's a question of antitrust. And we have two speakers here actually who are experts on, on antitrust. So I will throw some questions to the panelists in rotation. We hope we will have time to entertain uh, one or two questions from participants. Uh, we have the chat box, uh, which I noticed has not been used all day, but uh, it's there. If anyone from the audience wants to ask uh, or to raise questions, please do so and uh, write it in the, in the chat box. So let me start with the first questions. Uh, this is for... Andrea Moon, uh, how do you see the various legislative initiatives uh, that are taking place or happening in many countries, in, including in Germany? Can you comment on, on, on the comparison and which one is uh, stronger or better in, in your opinion? Yeah, many thanks, uh, Andy, and many thanks for having me on this panel. Um, you just said that the, the EU is, is ahead. Um, well, my personal view would be that Germany is maybe ahead because our amendment uh, of the German Competition Act is already in place uh, since January uh, 2021. So uh, we are already working uh, with, with, these, with these new provisions. Um, and uh, maybe also have gained some experience on how to regulate or how to 
enforce competition law in this area. I mean, it's clean that, that uh, platforms have even become stronger during uh, COVID-19. We have seen the growth of turnover uh, of Amazon, uh, of others. We have seen how even more important some of these have become. So it's not a, it's not a wonder that all um, jurisdictions around the world are looking for the right way to regulate uh, these country, these companies or maybe not regulate how to uh, strengthen competition law. So if you look at the recent German uh, competition law amendment in, in January 2021, uh, the key purpose was uh, to strengthen uh, the provisions on abuse of a dominant position. Um, this amendment had one core element in our law that is a new section 19a um, which should allow us as a competition agency to be faster and to be more effective uh, in dealing with these uh, big companies, especially, which is maybe most important, to intervene earlier, maybe already at a time uh, when the abuse hasn't, hasn't even happened. So this new approach includes kind of a two-step process the first step is that we have to designate companies that are of paramount significance for competition across markets. That is very similar to what you find in the DMA, uh, where, where there's a saying about uh, core, core platforms, or that is very similar to what is happening in the UK, or uh, also with regard to huge uh, platforms. Um, we have already initiated proceeding against all four uh, big tech companies, all four GAFAs. That is the designation process that these companies are of paramount significance for competition across uh, markets. Um, in a second step, uh, we will have to decide which kind of behavior we are going to prohibit uh, to these companies. Um, the law lists a number of behavior that we can prohibit among them is self-preferencing, very important, uh, including envelopment strategies with regard to new markets. Um, there are uh, pro practices uh, related to the processing of data uh, and the portability uh, of, uh, of data. So you see easily there is a huge overlap uh, with Articles 5 and 6 um, of the DMA. But maybe to conclude um, in, in this answer, but there are also some important differences with regard to the DMA. The first difference is that we do kind of a qualitative assessment which companies are subject to this new provision 19A. Um, the designation process under the DMA um, is, uh, goes along turnover, monthly active users, so it's more figure driven. Uh, the second difference is um, the DMA imposes the obligations directly on the companies. They are supposed to be kind of self-enforcing, um, as we put it. We in Germany have to take an approach uh, on a case-by-case -case basis where we prohibit a certain conduct. Uh, thirdly, um, under our uh, provision in Germany, undertakings can justify their behavior. That is not really foreseen under the DMA. Um, and fourthly, from our perspective, the new German provision, Article 19a, is a bit more flexible with regard to catch new abusive conduct. The, the, the DMA uh, has a final list of, of conduct uh, which needs to be amended from time to time. Uh, Article 19a seems to be more flexible. If, if we look beyond uh, the European borders at the United States, um, I think the American Choice and Innovation Online Act 2021 is very, very similar uh, to the DMA, maybe a bit, a bit more focused on larger platform uh, operators. Um, also self-executing uh, like the DMA. So all in all, I, th I see a very strong overlap. So um, Article 19A, the DMA 
and the US proposals, they share very many similarities. Uh, and I think um, they are a huge step forward to make competition agencies more effective and faster in this respect. Uh, one last sentence, I think it's important to know that in, in Germany we have, have not only looked at the administrative proceedings, but also as, at the judicial proceedings. So it's important to note uh, that if we take a decision based on the new provision, Article 19a, we go directly to the federal Supreme Court uh, in Karlsruhe. So with regard to our decisions, there will be only one instance before court. And if we look at recent court proceedings, for example, against uh, Facebook, where we have seen kind of a ping pong between two courts with regard to certain decisions, I think that was a very important step, not only uh, to make us more effective and faster, but also to make the courts more effective. And, faster. and I think it's very important to see that uh, together if you really want to have some success uh, in, in your striving to tame uh, the big tech giants. Many thanks. Thank you, Andres. I thank you for correcting that. Yes, uh, national governments are actually enacting legislations and I know that Germany is probably the most aggressive of all in uh, not so much regulating, but I guess you, you will use the word competition. And certainly that's fair competition among the big techs. Uh, let me turn to uh, Prabhat uh, on the question of the Digital Services Act and Digital Marketing, Digital Market Act. Can you tell us about, uh, or Andreas already mentioned some of that, but maybe you can elaborate on that, please. Yes. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Andy, and also thanks to Andreas for the great uh, uh, introduction. I, I, I think um, it's um, a pleasure to be here, but just to highlight actually um, the European Commission in, in its approach uh, last uh, December presented two parallel legal uh, legislative initiatives on regulating big tech, if you like, the Digital Services Act, which is more focused on societal concerns that uh, ar arise. Um, in uh, in online platforms and uh, the Digital Markets Act, which is more focused on fair competition, um, and uh, and we wanted to present them as a kind of comprehensive approach to uh, regulating uh, big tech, covering a really very broad range of issues, ranging from um, you know unfair data practices or um, self preferencing practices by some of the large gate gatekeeper platforms, but ranging in the Digital Services Act also to emerging issues around algorithmic amplification and, and uh, disinformation, as well as illegal content, which is very much the focus of the Digital Services Act. So um, we tried with uh, two uh, um, proposals to first present a Europe-wide approach to these issues, uh, um, you know, a single set of rules for the full continent, and secondly, to cover um, a broad range of issues, not just limited to fair competition, but also to address in the Digital Services Act, um, the societal concerns. And, and maybe um, I just want to uh, jump off a comment that you made about the, the testimony um, in, in uh, um, Congress of a former Facebook employee, I think very much highlighted some of the, um, the importance of uh, um, actually um, providing for some external uh, independent oversight uh, and this links also to uh, the oversight board, uh, Andy, that you're working on, on some of the um, internal processes uh, that are going on in, in some of these companies. Uh, last week, we talked about Instagram and, and Facebook and how content is amplified selectively and, and to put in place a framework of, um, of independent regulatory oversight um, so that, uh, that, that these uh, practices can be um, analyzed and scrutinized, be put to the public and be put in the, in, you know, out there for public debate um, without relying on, on internal com company documents being, being, being leaked or taken out um, and to have a, a, a regulatory conversation about uh, what the right thing to do is in these very complex um, gatekeeper companies. So Andy, maybe I, I'd be happy to elaborate more on some certain specific elements but uh, since I know that we have an international audience, I think uh, I want to just uh, perhaps limit myself to, um, to this high-level overviews and stress maybe three particular points. One is 
that um, we have been very careful throughout the two proposals, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, to uh, um, put human rights and internet and fundamental rights in the European Union at the um, center stage of some of the um, proposals, particularly in the area of content uh, um, moderation. Second element that I want to highlight is that unlike some previous proposals, which focused on individual items of content, uh, when it comes to content regulations, we've taken in both proposals more what I would call a systems approach. Right? So it's not just individual uh, items of content, individual companies, individual um, conduct, but it is a, a more a systemic look at the ecosystem, either intra-company or uh, um, intra, in, intra-conglomerate, if you like, uh, in the case of the Digital Markets Act. And the third element, I think, which is important to highlight on the Digital Markets Act, um, is that indeed uh, for, like Andreas has said, the, the self-executing immediately applicable nature was very important for us um, for um, not only the signaling power, but to um, bring change quickly to the whole industry and not just to individual uh, companies. And, and, um, and this is why we have designed uh, the Digital Markets Act in the way that we've designed it. But um, those are just the kind of three highlights that I would, uh, I would cover. Um, in this particular point and, and maybe also just to um, give you a bit of a flavor because we are in the middle of the legislative markup process at the moment. I think that it's fair to say that um, the two proposals have been received very well and are progressing uh, very fast um, through the legislative process at the moment. And many intense discussions have been made priority by, uh, by the European um, um, legislator. And so um, we look forward to um, them uh, also uh, coming uh, online, if you like, uh, not so much later than the German pioneering work that Andreas has mentioned earlier. Thank you very much, Andy. Just uh, maybe a question from someone who's ignorant about European uh, Commission. If and when the Digital Services Act is actually put in place, how does that work with the national laws that uh, member countries are putting up? Uh, Anders mentioned some overlapping, but which which takes precedence? I guess national laws takes precedence over the European Union. Is that correct? I, I wouldn't say it this way, Andy. I mean, uh, um, what we are striving at is, is a mechanism of cooperation uh, between the Euro European Commission and national competition agencies. Uh, we have proven in the past, we will still come to that maybe, we have proven in the past that either can do excellent work um, on these big on these big tech companies. We have had successful uh, cases with Amazon, Facebook, and others. So I think that is key. Uh, of course, the DMA will be a very powerful tool in the hand of the European Commission. But remember that also competition law remains applicable in the future. So what is really needed here is, is an instrument for cooperation and coordination like we have already in the European Competition Network, and we will try to make use, use of this in the future. Thank you. Let me turn to Tina. Uh, you, I think, campaigned successfully in getting a huge uh, penalty against Amazon. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, in terms of the, the, the current uh, efforts to come up with uh, uh, legislations against uh, big tech. How do you think should countries cooperate in managing cross-border cases? Thank you, Andy, and uh, good afternoon from Luxembourg. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this prestigious conference. It has well, uh, so Andreas and uh, Prabhat have given a good introduction to the topic. And um, as you mentioned, I am from data protection and I can only see the topic from the data protection perspective. And this proposal introduced by the European Commission in December uh, 2020, this single set of new rules that is applicable across the whole e EU and has two main goals First, to create a safe and more digital space in which the fundamental rights of all users of digital services are protected. And secondly, to establish a level playing field to foster innovation, growth and competitiveness, both in the single market and globally. This new proposal 
is in line with the general data protection regulation, the rules of which are not changed and also have to be respected under the new legislation. They are a single set of the GDPR rules that apply to all actors across the EU and the European economic area, a set of rules that is seen as a global standard in data protection legislation, leading other regions of the world to start developing similar regulations. The GDPR has helped move data protection rights into the spotlight and has sparked the adoption of data protection legislation across the world. The digital services package has the potential to lead the way just as the GDPR. As for data protection, the data protection authorities of the 27 EU member states and the member states of the European Economic Area compose the European Data Protection Board. We issue general guidance to promote a common understanding of European data protection laws, both across the European Union and around the world. Next to providing guidance, ensuring consistency in enforcement and cooperation between national authorities is a key task of the EDPB. To that end, we adopt consistency decisions and opinions in cross-border data protection cases, just as we did, well, we didn't do a consistency decision in the Amazon um, case, but it was a decision that was agreed upon by the 27 uh, countries plus, plus the three of the European Economic Area, and we did it by consensus, which means uh, an Article 60 procedure and not a dispute resolution procedure. In any case, we adopt consistency decisions and opinions that are addressed to national supervisory authorities to ensure consistency of the regulatory activities at national levels. While DPAs do cooperate now already, the EDPB will cooperate, will reinforce the cooperation by establishing a coordinated enforcement framework to facilitate joint actions in a flexible but coordinated manner, ranging from joint awareness raising and information gathering to enforcement sweeps and joint investigations. Furthermore, the EDPB is establishing a support tool of experts to provide expert support for investigations and enforcement activities of significant common interest. This will further enhance the cooperation and solidarity between all the ESAs working together under the GDPR, and it can serve as a model for new legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Uh, let me turn to Sean. Uh, the United States is seen as a, a laggard in regulating big techs, uh, but now with the events that happened last week, uh, is it going to be moving faster than, uh, than has been the case? Well, thank you, Indy, and yes, good morning from Washington and good afternoon to all of you uh, who have joined us uh, this afternoon. I think I am uh, here to be the counterpoint uh, to all of uh, the government officials that are lined up here. And yes, you can call me skeptical uh, of the conversation. I, I guess I'm not necessarily convinced that Washington or Brussels or Berlin uh, knows best. Uh, and therefore, I think it's not necessarily a race for who gets the first regulation on the books. It's not a race for who gets the toughest regulation on the books. Uh, it's a question of who gets the right and appropriate regulation on the books. Um, when we think about these issues at, as, at the chamber, we, we represent not only those companies that you all name uh, as GAFA, but we also represent small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, so we have within our membership the full range of the business community. Uh, so we think about this from a principled approach. Uh, first, we look at the motivations uh, for why it is that we see these movements not only here in the United States, but around the world. And when you look at those, they kind of fall into three categories. Some of the motivations are clearly discriminatory. Uh, they're there to target strictly American firms. Uh, certainly, if you were to change the prescription to apply to more companies, suddenly the interest for doing so would, would fall. Uh, secondly, we see political motivations. Certainly, some of the motivations for why it's happening here in the United States uh, line up very well uh, with, with politics more than substance. And then there's a third category, which is that there are legitimate issues that the digital transformation of the economy has brought forward that need to be addressed. Uh, and sorting through those motivations is very helpful to figuring out whether or not one has got the right regulatory approach. 
the second thing, if you do focus on those kind of legitimate concerns that are out there, uh, it's important to understand that not all problems are created equal. Uh, when we talk about uh, these issues and big tech platforms, people say, well, they're big. OK, they're big, uh, but bigness and scale can be very useful and helpful. Uh, but nobody can seem to agree on what the problem is. The problems people have with Facebook or the problems people have with Apple or the problems people have with Facebook or the problems people have with Google, they aren't all the same problems. Yet we see a one size fits all regulatory approach to trying to solve for them. Which brings us to, I think, the third point, which is the difference between antitrust and regulation. Uh, antitrust, uh, when you think about it, is a uh, ex post tool. In other words, uh, allow all businesses to go out and compete. And if their uh, approach to competition crosses a line, then you correct it after the fact. Uh, in the contrast to regulation, regulation is to decide on the front end, we're going to go out and prevent certain behaviors in the market. And one way to think about those differences is to say antitrust is really to allow the market to decide market outcomes, whereas regulation is there to actually kind of design the outcome in the market. And when you think about that and you think about what's happening in the DMA or what's happened in Germany or what's happening in the United States, uh, and you run it through those lenses, you realize nobody has the right approach. Uh, if one has concerns, for example, about Google and the way in which search is conducted, why wouldn't you put a pl in place a regulatory proposal that would govern search practices? If you have concerns about Amazon and small businesses having access to e-commerce platforms, why wouldn't you put together a proposal for small businesses in terms of guaranteeing certain kind of rights and put certain kinds of responsibilities on Amazon for how those businesses access the e-commerce platforms uh, and so on and so forth. Yet that is not what we're doing. Uh, and so I think we think that when we see what's happening, we, we look for the law of unintended consequences uh, in terms of the approaches we, we see uh, on the horizon today. Uh, in response to whether or not the United States is going to play catch up, um, I think the answer to that is no. Uh, again, I don't think it's a race for who can get out there first. Uh, it's a race to figure out who can build the best regulatory mousetrap that would you know, address the legitimate concerns that can be identified, but leave alone the market to function. Uh, more freely. Uh, and I think in that sense, uh, we will have changes in the United States. There's no doubt about that. But will they come as quickly as maybe the rest of the world would like to see? I think the answer to that is no. Thank you, Sean. But just a follow-up question. But there is uh, now a movement in Congress to try to regulate big techs, right, in the event of the disclosure, the outage of Facebook last week. Plus a few other things before then. So, how you're just, you, I mean, you're provi providing the counterpoint, but I think within the United States uh, politics, it's, it's also bipartisan. And there is a move to actually to start regulating the uh, bank, bank, uh, big banks. So I think you, you, you asked two questions there. One is uh, kind of in relationship to Section 230, which is uh, akin to the DSA in some way, shape, or form. Uh, 230 reform, I think, is going to happen at some point. I don't think we're going to get rid of 230. One of the big differences, I think, between the United States and questions of content moderation that exist in other parts of the world uh, is that we have a very litigious environment in the United States. And so we have a very kind of special, highly uh, legal system that would uh, you know, open up all kinds of private litigation in ways that I think adds another dimension to the debate here in the United States. Uh, and so I think trying to find that balance between preventing uh, kind of lawsuits run amok uh, from what one could do with uh, regard to content moderation and balancing all of that with the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, which says government can't dictate speech, finding those kind of that sweet spot between those three uh, kind of anchors in the debate, I don't think is very clear or easy. Yes, I think people say we need to do something, but what does that solution path look like? Uh, do you have legislation in Congress that can get uh, enough votes in the House, enough votes in the Senate, and reach the president's desk? The answer is today you do not. Switching gears to the conversation around antitrust uh, and regulation, here too, uh, the bipartisan nature of this uh, is fairly thin. Uh, I say that because uh, the bills that uh, Andreas mentioned that came out of the House, uh, even the Democrat leader in the House said these bills are flawed. Uh, and is going to call for a vote. The Republican leader in the House also said these bills are flawed and aren't going to come for a vote. So when you look at the depth of bipartisan support for the legislative proposals, 
it is nowhere near as deep or as wide as perhaps an outside observer might agree, even as the energy around doing something is bipartisan. So as I said, I think you know we can identify legitimate problems and people will have different views as to what they think the problem is, but we can't get agreement on what the problem is universally, nor can we get agreement on what the right solution is. So I think there's still a fair amount of time on the clock here in the United States to figure out what is the right path forward, uh, both from a standpoint of regulatory, regulating these things in the name of kind of driving market outcomes, but also societal priorities around kind of free speech and content moderation. Thank you, Sean. Uh, let me go back to Andres. Uh, from the perspective of a national competition agency, what, in your opinion, are the main competition concerns which need to be addressed with regard to big tech? And how have the national competition agencies made use of the tools available to them? Well, well many, maybe I, I, would like, I would like to start with a very short answer to Sean's introductory uh, remarks. Um, I'm not so sure that I agree with everything. I mean, to start uh, with the question, do, do we have something against big country, companies? Of course not. We have nothing against big companies, but we have something against big companies, dominant companies, if they abuse their dominance. That is our point. It is not about bigness or just being big. I mean, that's fair. That's, uh, that's nothing what a competition uh, agency would go against. Um, second point, is it good to be fast? I think this is, this is an important point because we see harm happening every day. I mean, we're talking about ecosystems that set the rules and they set the rules for new entrants who probably might not be able to enter the market. Um, so I think also from a legislative point of view, it's not a mistake to be fast because we as agency also try to be fast. Is it necessary to be tough? I think it is uh, to a certain extent because what we see is severe harm. And if you see severe harm, you might also be willing to take uh, tough consequences and uh, to have the best regulation. This is what we're striving for. I also agree uh, with Sean that we are confronted with very differentiated business models. But nevertheless, if you look at the legislation going on in, in Europe or at, at uh, the legislation that we have taken here in, in Germany, it is based on solid competition cases that we have seen in the past. When we talk about prohibiting self-preference, this is because we know from many cases that self-preference by these big techs uh, just leads to the consequence that their dominance is deepened. The same is true for in and development strategies on new market, and the, the same is true for, um, for, pro for preventing the portability uh, of data. I mean, this are, these are our main concerns to come back to your question, and, uh, Andy. We talk about ecosystems, as I said, that set the rules, which means a competitor, a new entrant, has to play by the textbook, by the rules of these ecosystems. And you can imagine how difficult it is for a new entrant, for an innovative company to enter a market where the rules are set by your dominant competitor. That is what we are worried about. We are worried about harm for consumers. If you look at the Facebook case um, of the Federal Cartel Office, you see that Facebook is collecting data from every user in the internet. Not only if you are if you're doing, uh, if you are as a user are active on Facebook, also if you're active on the affiliates of like WhatsApp, like Instagram. Whenever you see a little blue dot uh, on a website, a share or a like button, uh, Facebook collects your data as a user. And even if you see nothing of Facebook, you can be safe and sure that Facebook is collecting your data in a limitless manner. And that is the precondition for making use of Facebook as a user. This is our uh, main concern. 
If you look at other questions, take, for example, price parity clauses. We had here a very early case with Amazon already in 2013. It was one of our first cases when Amazon still had a clause in the terms and conditions for sellers on the Amazon marketplace that these sellers were not allowed to, to sell their products anywhere cheaper than on the Amazon marketplace. Um, I mean, price parity clauses can hinder uh, competition tremendously. This is what we know from these cases. Another example were the price parity clauses on Booking.com. When Booking.com come, said, come to me, uh, hotel owners may now set a lower price anywhere than on Booking.com. I mean, that's good for Booking.com, but that is not so good for the consumer and that is not so good for the hotel owner. This was also one of our early cases, and I'm very happy that we won this case before the Federal Supreme Court here in Germany, and that we have prohibited to Booking.com to make use of these um, price parity clauses to the detriment of hotel owners and the consumers. And I'm very happy that we gave back the freedom to the hotel owners to set their own price for their property, which is their hotel rooms, and not leave that to Booking.com as a dominant platform with such an influence uh, on where to set the price. And all this is to the detriment of both competitors and consumers. And this is why I think it is so uh, extremely important uh, that we are doing these cases, and this is exactly where our competition sorrows uh, come from, because we are not just dealing with dominant companies. You find that in the in the traditional offline world, where you might have a, a dominant company in the branch of steel or of wood, but then this is a dominant company in one market. When we talk about ecosystems, we talk about systems that might have several platforms that are dominant in several markets uh, and that are able to steer to a certain degree at least of what is happening in the internet. Um, so this is the, the concern um, that it is not just a dominant company. And this is why they, they deserve a special treatment. It is about ecosystems that allow for competition only on the margins of these ecosystems, but not on the inside, not with regard uh, to the core business. Um, and this is why, why uh, there are so many cases going on. Uh, and this is why, and, and this is to conclude, I believe that the DMA, uh, Article 19a here in Germany, and the proposals uh, that we have uh, seen in the United States, these proposals rely to a very high extent not on, on a blueprint that we have just been thinking of at a table. This comes from harm that we have seen in the past. This comes from competition cases that we have led in the past and which partly have been confirmed uh, by the highest courts in one or the other country. Very last sentence, we will get a ruling of the uh, European Court of Justice on our Facebook ruling with regard to uh, the data gathering and processing uh, of Facebook. There you also see the, well, the, the, the links between competition law on the one side and privacy issues on the other side. We will get a clear ruling here also from the European Court of Justice. So I agree, uh, not one size fits all, but I think we have approaches which allow for a specific regulation for all of these companies. And I think this is a huge step forward. Thank you, Andres. Uh, Prabhat, uh, can you talk a, a little bit more about the Digital Service Act and the Digital Market Act when it comes to defining uh, the big tech? Uh, is that an issue for, for this, this legislation or uh, or maybe you're not so much concerned about defining, defining the, com the company, but more about the products or the services they provide. Yes. 
Thank you, Andy. Um, actually, in the European Union, we have a very, um, uh, uh, very, you know, complex and, and cumbersome transparent process um, uh, uh, called the impact assessment process, which is, takes many years to prepare, which actually forces us uh, to explain publicly exactly what the problem is. Um, what the scale and the range of different options that were considered are and why we chose the one that we chose. And, and this is all uh, in the public domain and is a mandatory element of our, um, of our proposals, including um, being transparent about the evidence base behind our problem analysis, um, the scale and size of the problems, who is affected and how exactly. So for the people who are really interested in, in the details of our problem analysis, uh, it's all uh, in the public domain and um, including all the, that's a very important point there. But just uh, on the, um, in the impact assessment process, which I think is actually rather unique in, 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 the, in, in the world, uh, which is a, 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 a mandatory requirement, uh, we took a rather nuanced approach to the problems that Sean and Andreas have, have outlined. And, and indeed, we have to be very clear to be um, precise about um, who, who is um, uh, um, you know, an actor in the, in the problem different, difference and how we define the, the actor. And in the DSA and the DMA, that we took two different approaches. In the Digital Services Act, um, like the name implies, we took a service-by-service -service approach. So we're not targeting undertakings or company, companies, but individual services. And this has been actually, this is a long-standing approach, already 22 years old, um, and it dates back to a, a piece of law known as the e-commerce directive. Um, where we say, for example, a company like Facebook, because they have been mentioned so many times in, the, in this discussion here, they would be offering many different uh, services. For example, they offer a marketplace, they offer a social media service, they offer also uh, um, their own content, you know, for example, on particular uh, types. And so each of the, under the Digital Services Act, the, reg the rules that are laid down, they apply service by service and, and not uh, to any individual company. And, same. and in the Digital Markets Act, um, we look more at undertakings, uh, which is similar to uh, the concept that is used in competition law. So uh, um, and there we have introduced the notion of gatekeeper companies and, and they, in these gatekeeper companies, like Andreas has said, operate different uh, core platform services. So. Um, in the Digital Services Act, the only other distinction we have made um, is, um, so it's a service by service approach, but also we have differentiated rules according to what type of, um, what is the exact role and responsibility for a particular intermediary in the chain uh, of uh, dissemination of potentially illegal content. And, and therefore, you, some of you will remember in the January 6th attacks on, on the um, on the Capitol Hill, for example, Amazon Web Services um, discontinued a, a social media site called Parler, or um, Cloudflare um, is a is a content uh, delivery network. You know, was involved in in uh, sp speech sites such as 4chan or 8chan, and, and discontinued those as well. Those are intermediaries which we call kind of technical intermediaries. They don't really host any content themselves but they are very important parts of the ecosystem. So in the Digital Services Act, we also have some due diligence and due process rules um, for, for those actors. And then it ranges all the way up to marketplaces, um, search engines and, and, uh, and social media websites. And I would say that the, these rules are quite, um, quite differentiated. Uh, and in the Digital Markets Act, it's, uh, it's quite similar as well. We have a range of different um, types of core platform services and the rules are articulated around um, the nature of those core platform services. One small comment, if I may, um, uh, Sean made a very good comment. If you have a problem with search engines, why don't you um, regulate search engine behavior? Or if you have problems with small businesses, SMEs, accessing um, big marketplaces, why don't you regulate that access? Just want to point out that this is exactly what we've already done a couple of years ago at the European Union level in a so-called platform to business regulation which included um, transparency rules for ranking um, transparency on search engine because a lot of traders could not understand why one day they were on page one and the next day they were on page five. And we had um, a, a, a meaningful, I think also, it was a, a first algorithmic transparency disclosure rule in the platform to business regulation. And second, we had fair access rules um, for small and medium enterprises accessing uh, marketplaces such as Amazon 
for example, they need to give prior, they need to be given prior notice before they are delisted. Those kind of fair access rules as well. So just to say that there's a bit of backstory there, and we do take a, in our view, a very targeted problem specific approach in these uh, these approaches. You know, so but we maybe Andy, if I just have the floor, I just want to say one thing because um, it's not just only about what we are doing and what others and what Germany is doing or what the United States are doing. I think. One thing that I want to just point out is that actually we have just recently, uh, following the summit between U.S. President Joe Biden and, and the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, um, started an engagement process around the Trade and Technology Council, which covers many different um, topics, uh, 10 different working areas, many of them security related. But there's one which is particularly also focusing on cooperation in the future um, on issues uh, such as algorithmic amplification or um, data access for independent researchers so that, that platforms um, content moderation practices can be scrutinized independently or what kind of transparency requirements are really meaningful and useful either for business users or for end users as well. And so I actually think um, that there is a lot of common ground in um, the problem definitions around the world. And I actually do agree with Sean, this is not a beauty contest about who has the most beautiful regulation here. It's about getting results on the ground that, that really make a difference for citizens. And, and uh, I think cooperation in the future and, and inter alia and the, the Trade and Technology Council is a really important component there. Thank you, Prabhat. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Timo Wolken. Uh, he is a member of the European Parliament. Uh, we, we have been discussing about the various legislation initiatives in. Uh, to regulate the, the, the big tech. Uh, can you, uh, Timo, can you uh, explain to us what is happening within the European Parliament, uh, especially with regard to the, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Market Act? Uh, it's not uh, uh, everyone going in one direction. I, I believe there's also some opposition uh, within the European Parliament. Can you explain what, what is happening there? Yes, I'm happy to do so. First of all, uh, my apologies for being late and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, debate today, which is indeed very timely and very uh, important. And uh, Prabhat uh, already uh, highlighted um, what we are or what the European Union is trying to achieve with the DMA and the DSA. So in the European Parliament, we, we needed a few weeks to sort our things and to decide which co which committee should be the competent one and which committees are writing opinions, um, we are now in the in the middle of a very heated debate. So the jury committee, the legal affairs committee, was the very first committee uh, presenting its opinion on the DMA and on the DSA. Uh, I think we really have to distinguish both acts, and we should really. Um, should we, we need to realize that both acts are equally important, but they are indeed designed to fulfill different uh, tasks. Uh, looking at the DSA, the DSA is designed to uh, more or less um, outline uh, a digital constitution for Europe. And it, it should cover all services, not only the big services. And um, I think uh, it's really important that we um, that that in the DSA we make things right because this is our last bullet. So um, on the DSA, I see in the European Parliament a strong push to also regulate uh, marketplaces in the DSA. And I think here we need to be very, very careful uh, that we do not uh, accidentally uh, introduce regulation that may work for marketplaces, uh, but is ill-suited for, for example, social media. So personally, I would therefore argue to make a clear distinction. So on the one hand, transaction platforms for the provisions of goods and services on the one hand, and interaction platforms for the communication exchange between people on the other hand. I believe both types have uh, quite different requirements, as I said. Uh, for instance, we may consider that measures to keep uh, illegal products of um, of a marketplace through an automated tool is 
or may be appropriate, but the same tool could have disastrous effects if it's applied on social media platforms because it will not be able to sufficiently distinguish between illegal and uh, legal content. So, um, and there is a quite heated debate about this. Uh, on the DMA, um, I really believe the DMA is marking and making uh, an important step of classifying so-called gatekeepers as dominant platforms that end users and business users have no real way to avoid. And I believe this is a very sensible concept, a sensible concept in principle and firmly rooted in the observations of actual network effects and other factors. However, um, we do need to make sure that the definition of gatekeepers, uh, gatekeeper itself is future-proof. And this is where the discussion circulates uh, at the moment in the parliament. And I believe that we should widen the scope of the DMA and we should not only try to target the um, already existing big players like GAFA. So we should, we should make a future-proof regulation which uh, would allow us to um, also uh, have a tool for platforms who will become dominant in the future. So um, this is, I think, uh, absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely important and uh, it's critical to the long-term success of the regulation. For instance, and with this, I'm going to finish. For instance, by increasing the list of potential platform services under the regulation or making it a non-exhaustive list to begin with. In the end, gatekeepers need to be classified based on qualitative assessments, not uh, only their size or qu quantitative factors. And this is what's, uh, yeah, qu quite, quite uh, this is a quite hot debate in the European Parliament at the moment. Thank you, Timo. Can I turn to Tina? Uh, can you tell us about how the, the CNPD assess uh, tech companies and how you initiate the uh, investigations? Yes, sure. Um, there is a, a lot of leg legislation and there are many initiatives going on. But one thing we have uh, noticed in Luxembourg is that most organizations want to get their compliance right. Of course, new rules and extensive rules are burdensome to comply with. But as with the GDPR, the digital services package represents a step change rather than a leap into the unknown. With the digital services package, large fines and breaks up are threatening for non-compliance. It is proposed if companies refuse to obey, they could be forced to hand over up to 10% of their European turnover. Much of the criticism about GDPR had focused on the perceived burdens it placed on SMEs and smaller organizations. We have long recognized that SMEs may have limited time and resources for compliance and have acknowledged this in our regulatory approach. But many of these criticisms fail to recognize the flexibility that the key principles in the GDPR provide. They scale the task of compliance to the risk. Like the GDPR, the Digital Services Package is a single set of rules for the EU to keep users safe online, protect their freedom of expression and help both them and local authorities hold tech companies to account. It introduces a sliding scale under which firms take on more obligations, the larger and more influential they are. This is also a criteria for the assessment of the platforms. The principles are essentially the same whether you are a small business or a multinational corporation. It is not the size of the organization that, that's relevant so much as the risk that particular businesses and types of data processing pose. Those handling particularly sensitive data or processing personal data in potentially intrusive ways, for example. Whatever the size of the organization, GDPR is essentially about trust. Building trusted relationships with the public will enable the organizations to sustainably build their use of data and gain more value. Through changing their data handling culture, 
organizations can derive new value from customer relationships. As a data protection supervisory authority, our mission is safeguarding data protection rights by driving compliance through awareness, guidance, supervision, and enforcement. In Luxembourg, an investigation can be opened at the initiative of the CMPD, for example, within the framework of thematic uh, campaigns, following up with a complaint or at the proposal of uh, one of our four commissioners. In addition, the CMPD constantly examines the commercial practices of certain data controllers, for example, before the marketing of new technological products or services. And we also follow the media and keep abreast of any observations communicated by other European authorities and might decide to open investigations in case of doubt. Um, as to the question you have not asked, but it is a question, if we have the tools to manage platforms, the answer is yes, as regards data protection. Article 58 of the GDPR provides for the powers of DPAs, and they are large. They range from investigative powers to corrective powers, which are issue warnings, issue reprimands, order the controller or the processor to comply with the data subject's request to exercise his or her rights pursuant to this regulation, to impose administrative fines, or another example, to order the suspension of data flows to a recipient in a third country or to an international organization. And we have authorization and advisory powers. So our toolbox is well equipped for our enforcement task. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Tina. Uh, John. Uh, John. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the section 230, uh, which is basically uh, what was the question how do you define the big tech, whether they're a tech company or they're a publisher? You, you don't think, or do you think this is going to change now, given the, the recent? Uh, events and movement within Congress? Well, as, as I said, I, I think that uh, last week's events uh, brought more political pressure to do something uh, in response to uh, what I think a lot of people see as a real and legitimate problem around uh, social media and fake news and other related matters. That being said, the political support for doing that looks different, uh, whether you're on the Republican side of the aisle or the Democratic side of the aisle. Uh, plus, I think you have to balance uh, that motivation with concerns around our constitutional First Amendment right to free speech, uh, the issues that I mentioned before about uh, our litigious society here in the United States where everyone wants to go and sue. Uh, and so I think that there is still uh, some time before when sees a legislative package emerge either in the House or in the Senate. Uh, you have to remember, we have a very narrowly divided Senate. Uh, there's 50 Republicans and 50 Democrat senators. Uh, it only takes one senator uh, to really start a train of folks to, to prevent uh, what they call a filibuster uh, from happening. You have to get 60 votes in the Senate to prevent that. So um, the path forward for 230 reform, uh, I think remains uncertain, even as the political pressure to do something uh, continues to rise. I very quickly go back to my friend Andreas's comments. The three cases you brought up, Andreas, all happened, as you well know, under the old law, not under the new law. Um, I think you know you and I could go back and forth as to whether your remedy on Facebook makes a lot of sense. I'm sure you've heard those arguments, um, but I would uh, say to to uh, on the DMA, um, look, if we're targeting the conduct of being a gatekeeper, that's one thing. If you're targeting an enterprise, that's another. You think of Amazon. Amazon is not only a retailer, but they also have a large part of their business that's in cloud computing, and then they have a part of their business that is in media. Um, is all three of those businesses gatekeepers? Well, most of the time when I hear people's concerns with Amazon and self-preferencing, uh, it's in the context of them being a retailer. Uh, yet these different kind of business functions are not necessarily distinguished in the DMA in a way that uh, ensures that you know the functionality of Amazon when it's operating its cloud computing services, it has to follow the same do's and don'ts in the DMA as it does when it's operating its retail side of the business. This goes back to my point, unless we identify the specific problems we're interested in trying to resolve and tailor a legislative and regulatory solution to it, 
we will end up overreaching with these proposals. Thank you, Sean. We have been uh, right. Uh, we also bear this now. So I think we have to wrap this up. I'm sorry, we have too many, too many things to discuss, but uh, this has been a good uh, conversation, very lively. Uh, still so many things uh, to discuss, but I think the future looks uh, pretty good. Uh, we are now moving to bring some regulations, uh, different levels in different countries uh, over the, the big power, big uh, tech companies. I'll leave it at that, and um, I would thank all the, the, uh, the panelists for their contribution and uh, giving the floor back to Ben. Thank you.